All right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is David Holst, orthopedic surgeon with Ortho Virginia. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on this uh, Facebook Live. Uh, we're gonna be talking about partial knee replacement and total knee replacement. Before we get started, just wanted to quickly say uh, a few words of introduction about our practice. Ortho Virginia um, is a large practice here in the state of Virginia. We have offices in multiple spots. Um, I am currently in the Richmond location. Um, and if you want more information about our practice, you can um, see more on orthovirginia.com. Um, by way of introduction about myself, um, I did my medical school training in Wake Forest, uh, or I should say at Wake Forest University in North Carolina, followed by my residency there as well. And then I completed a one year fellowship, which is just a fancy way of saying an extra year of training uh, for hip and knee reconstruction or hip and knee replacement um, out in Colorado, uh, in Denver at Colorado Joint Replacement. I was in practice for a few years in North Carolina, but I'm happy to be here um, in practice now at Ortho Virginia. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to take just a little bit of time to um, talk about partial knee replacement versus total knee replacement. But before I say that, I just wanted to say just a little bit about what I find interesting or engaging about knee surgery. Um, th these are very common problems that we see. Uh, patients uh, with knee complaints um, are very numerous. Uh, many, many patients will struggle with knee pain um, over the course of their lives. And so it's a very common thing that we see in the clinic. Doing surgery is one part of what we do, but it's not the only part. The surgery itself is technically challenging, but it's very gratifying. Um, I think the things that drew me to knee surgery are really the same things that drew me to orthopedics in general. It's a technical challenge, but it gets immediate results. Um, they're fun surgeries. You, uh, you have the opportunity to make a great deal of difference in patients' lives. Uh, so that's what I really enjoy about knee surgery. And so I think uh, that is really what drew me into it. As far as context goes, uh, as I mentioned, many, many patients have knee pain. It's an extremely common complaint. If I look at my clinic schedule, that's probably actually the number one thing that I see is patients with ongoing knee pain. And it can be uh, pain that's been going on for many years, or it can be more acute pain. Uh, it varies in terms of how severe it is, um, but knee pain in general is something that's extremely common. Among those things that can cause knee pain, knee arthritis is one of the most common, if not the most common underlying reason. Uh, knee arthritis is essentially a process in which the cartilage becomes damaged or even completely lost in more advanced stages within the knee joint. Um, and that is something, again, that is a very common thing that we see every day, many times in, in clinic. Um, there's been a number of studies that have suggested that this is becoming more common. Um, we do have an aging population, which means that the average age of patients coming in um, is getting to be a little bit older as the demographics of the country change. And so this is becoming a problem that we're seeing very frequently and is projected to be um, even more common into the future. And when it gets to be more advanced, such as the x-rays that we see there at the bottom of the screen, um, where the two bones um, really are touching each other, this becomes more difficult to treat. Um, and so surgery is often used uh, to try to improve the quality of life of these patients. And it can make a really big, big difference. Obviously, short of that, we always try to avoid surgery when that's possible. Uh, we try to have patients to strengthen their legs, to do home exercises, sometimes to work on weight loss or to try injections. Um, sometimes that involves taking medicines. Um, but when things become more, more severe, uh, we certainly are not opposed to doing surgery uh, to actually treat that. We'll advance the slide there. And just um, a couple of words, I think this can be sometimes confusing without just a little bit of background, but the knee is basically divided into three parts or what we call compartments. On the inside of the knee, that's what we call the medial compartment. On the outside of the knee, that's what we call the lateral compartment. And then the kneecap gets its own compartment. So the kneecap glides within a groove on the femur. And so that's the third part of the knee. So we can essentially think of the knee as being uh, divided into those three parts. Uh, by volume, the knee is the largest joint in the body, um, and it's extremely common for folks to have problems within, uh, within the knee joint, affecting one or more of those compartments. 
So as I mentioned before, knee replacement surgery can take, you know, can take the form of the final line of treatment. Again, we don't jump right to that uh, because obviously it's invasive, involves some recovery and a little bit of risk when patients undergo surgery. And so we try to reserve it as the final line of treatment. But for many patients, it's the appropriate thing to do after all the other treatments are no longer working. And we can think about knee replacement surgery uh, coming in a couple of different flavors at least. One is the partial knee replacement, which really just replaces just the one part of the knee that is damaged. So we talked about the inner or the medial compartment. That's the most common compartment to be involved with advanced arthritis. And so a partial knee replacement to address that would just replace the inner part of the, of the knee joint. But if we think about knee replacement surgery in general, basically what we're trying to accomplish is to replace the damaged part of the joint. And the way we do that currently is with metal and plastic. Um, and so by using those prosthetic parts, we can recreate a smooth joint in place of the damaged one, which was rough or uh, involved bone going against bone instead of the way that it was meant to be, which is the cartilage against the cartilage. So that's the general idea of knee replacement surgery. We can think about partial knee replacements and total knee replacements as, as kind of having pros and cons. So on the right is a picture of an actual partial knee replacement. And again, that just replaces just, just the one part of the knee that is damaged. Um, advantages to, to doing partial knee replacement include that it's just a less invasive surgery. There's a smaller incision. Um, we don't have to expose as much of the knee in order to get done what we want to get done. And as a result of that, um, it tends to be easier to recover after the surgery. Most folks find that they have less uh, difficulty achieving um, the range of motion or the amount of movement that they can get in the knee after a partial knee replacement. And as a result of that, less therapy is often needed as part of their recovery. In many, many cases, patients with partial knee replacements, they can go home the same day of surgery quite easily. And so that's a, that's a distinct advantage. And in general, uh, partial knee replacement patients have less pain after the surgery. Um, another thing that, that we do find is that a partial knee replacement um, can feel more like your normal knee. Um, and that has to do with the fact that we're cutting out less of the uninvolved uh, parts of, of the knee that we might do in a total knee replacement. So that's the pros of a partial knee replacement or its advantages. So we advance to the potential disadvantages of a partial knee replacement. Um, it is a technically challenging operation. I think there's a little bit more ways for you um, to misstep or to, um, there's, there's just a lot to think about as you're doing the surgery. So it can be technically challenging. I think probably the biggest disadvantage is that not everyone is a candidate for partial knee replacements. Um, if you have damage to multiple parts within your knee, this may not be the right op operation for you. Um, and because it only replaces one part of the knee, you can go into develop arthritis in some of the rest of the knee that can require further treatment if that does happen. That doesn't happen in all cases, but that certainly can happen. So we would consider that to be a potential disadvantage of a partial knee replacement. As far as total knee replacement go, um, potential advantages, um, we may have advanced one slide too many, but uh, the total knee replacement, the advantages are that it's very reproducible. Um, we perform more total knee replacements um, than we do partial knee replacements. It, uh, it can, um, I, I, I think that almost everybody with knee arthritis has failed um, less invasive means is a potential candidate for that. Um, and again, it's very familiar in terms of what we do. Um, it's considered excellent in terms of its overall outcomes. Those are sort of the advantages of total, total knee replacements. As far as disadvantages goes, it's kind of the mirror image of the partial knee replacement advantages. It is a more invasive surgery. The knee is replaced in its entirety, and so it can, uh, and so the, the total knee replacement can kind of feel more artificial. Sometimes by virtue of it being um, a little bit more invasive, it can take a little longer to recover. Most patients have a little bit more pain with total knee replacement surgery than they do with partial knee replacement surgery. Um, and oftentimes uh, patients may require a brief hospital stay after a total knee replacement. And this is the slide. And, um, again, not to belabor the point, but um, as far as tips go, who may be a candidate? Well, for total knee replacement, um, things that we look at in terms of um, somebody being a candidate for that mode of treatment is that they do have advanced arthritis in one or more parts of the knee. 
And obviously we want them to have tried things short of doing surgery, because for some patients, those things will work, injections, medications, exercises, et cetera. Um, and we certainly want them to be having pain that is interfering with the quality of life before we undertake the surgery. Um, and lastly, we want them to be medically appropriate um, before doing the surgery. And if we pass the slide, what we'll see as far as partial knee replacement, it's really the exact same thing, except with, with just one important difference, and that's that they have advanced arthritis in only one of those three parts of the knee. So that's the critical difference um, in terms of who is a candidate. But all those other things are the same. Same sort of things that we would look at, that they have tried uh, less invasive things, but those are no longer effective, you know, they, but they do have pain that's interfering with their quality of life. Um, and that they're appropriate from a, from a medical standpoint in proceeding with surgery. So just to summarize, many types of knee pain are quite treatable. Um, we do have good solutions for a lot of different types of knee pain. Um, and so people should feel empowered, I think, to, to try and seek treatment if they are having knee pain that hasn't resolved on its own or that has gone on to affect their quality of life and that they feel as though is robbing them of something in their life. Um, I do want to reiterate, the first line of treatment does not necessarily involve surgery. You know, we want to try other things first. Uh, surgery is just for those cases where it continues to be a problem and that there's um, uh, and that there's not a lot of other options left. So those are sort of the take home points, I think. In conclusion, um, knee replacement surgery is an effective um, line of treatment for folks who have tried other things and those things are no longer working. Uh, to summarize, a partial knee replacement involves really just one of the three parts of, of the knee joint, um, whereas a total knee replacement involves all three parts of the knee. So that's the critical conceptual difference, I think. Uh, partial knee replacements um, they tend to be an excellent option for patients who are indeed a candidate for them. Similarly, total knee replacements are also an excellent form of treatment for, for many of those same patients or other patients who have arthritis in more than one part of the knee. I think those are some of the take home points for including things that I'd like to uh, mention there. I certainly don't want to leave some time for some questions though. So I think Margaret's going to try to um, pronounce some of those questions and I'd be happy to try to answer them. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Holst. So I will ask some questions. So what if you have arthritis in two parts of the knee? Do you have a partial knee replacement or a total knee replacement? So there, there are some people who do a, what's called a eye compartmental knee replacement, um, which is, is <laughs> I didn't really cover it in the talk, um, but such a thing does exist. Uh, it's not frequently done, um, and it's not a, a major part of my practice, um, but in that case, I would, um, you know, obviously if the, if the patient had exhausted um, normal conservative care, I think we would typically try shorter surgery, uh, that patient for me would be a candidate for a total, for a total knee replacement. Uh, but there are um, there are some surgeons who have tried uh, um, two partial knee replacements, for instance. Um, but that's but that's not a common thing that is very done or uh, that is done very frequently. Thank you. Uh, can you run after a knee replacement? So you can. There's there you know there's kind of some mixed data on this. Um, in in general, the um, the traditional teaching was that we didn't love for patients to be running on their knee replacement, simply because they're only good for however many millions of cycles. And we thought by running, we're effectively running out the miles available. I, I do think the teaching that has changed a little bit where we're doing the surgery in order to get patients to be more mobile and to try to enjoy more normal um, activities. And similarly, I don't think there's great uh, evidence to support that running or higher level activities will necessarily decrease the lifespan of a knee replacement. I think that's something that we've kind of taken for granted, um, but that we don't have great evidence to support that idea. So um, for patients of mine who, um, for whom that's, a, that's just a big important part of their life, I would say um, that they can certainly do it. Um, you know, I, I, I would have a conversation with them uh, that it's possible, at least from a theoretical standpoint, that they might decrease the lifespan of their knee replacement. Um, but in general, I wouldn't forbid a patient from actually doing that. Thank you. Is general anesthesia required? Actually, probably the majority of my neuroplastic patients um, are not done under general anesthesia. There's always some concern uh, with the risks associated with putting people under general anesthesia. Um, tends to have some dissociative 
effects in terms of waking back up and uh, and patients sometimes will describe kind of feeling out of it. Um, the majority of my surgeries, as far as the it goes, are done under spinal anesthetic. Certainly in some situations, we do do a general anesthetic for certain considerations. Um, and sometimes if a patient um, has uh, certain sets of considerations, that can be the route that we take, but that's not, um, I wouldn't say that's the majority or necessarily required. Thank you. In a partial knee replacement, do you leave the ACL and PCL? What about with a total knee replacement? I think that's a great question. Um, with a partial knee replacement, the idea is to is to leave the cruciate ligaments and to try to have the knee function in a more normal fashion. Um, so for certain designs of partial knee replacement, it's actually a reason that you can't have it done if, for instance, you're missing an ACL. Um, that's, I think the, the thinking on that is not absolute, uh, but for patients who do not have a well-functioning ACL, the thought is that a partial knee replacement might not work as well, um, at least for certain designs of it. Um, but in general, if someone has uh, a knee that is ACL deficient, meaning they don't have a well-functioning ACL, typically they'll have what's called post-traumatic arthritis, or it's not uncommon that they will have post-traumatic arthritis, in which case oftentimes they will have arthritis uh, in multiple parts of the knee, in which case they won't really get in it for partial knee replacement anyway. However, um, with a total knee replacement, or at least in the way that I do it, um, we do sacrifice uh, the ACL as well as the PCL uh, in order to perform the knee replacement. There are some designs that are um, that are able to keep the PCL, and even a very few um, or very small number of designs that actually keep uh, both the ACL and PCL. I would say from personal experience, usually when we're inside the knee um, performing a total knee replacement, you get a pretty good look at both of those ligaments, um, and they don't always appear normal. Uh, meaning that they may be involved in some of the degenerative changes uh, that we see mm -hmm. within the knee. Uh, so typically for a total knee replacement, just to summarize, um, we typically sacrifice those, um, or at least the ACL, uh, and then for a partial knee replacement, we tend to leave them. And that's one of the reasons that people think that a partial knee replacement feels more like a normal knee, because we're preserving more of those internal structures. Thank you. What is the recovery time for both types of knee replacement? Um, so the typical thought is that um, with a with a partial knee replacement, um, as well as a total knee replacement, just because it is major surgery, the first couple of weeks after the surgery, the patient can expect to have their knee quite sore and swollen and um, some degree of pain. Um, I, I typically will tell patients for the first month or so, they're still going to be in the acute recovery phase uh, for a total knee replacement, even up to about six weeks. And then I expect most of them will be back to full normal, unrestricted activities, um, you know, by a couple to three months out. So I typically use the rule of thumb, uh, for instance, that if you um, if you enjoy playing golf, to get back to 18 holes of golf is probably going to take you about three months for a total knee replacement. For partial knee replacement, um, the recovery course is a little bit more abbreviated, um, so that I think that they hit those marks um, sooner than a, than a total knee replacement. Uh, patient would. So all of those recovery things that I just that I just mentioned, those are brought up a couple of weeks um, with a partial knee replacement, uh, so that they tend to hit those recovery um, marks a, l a little bit sooner. Thank you. After surgery, are you on any type of medication to keep the body from rejecting the knee? Yeah, this is a, this is a, this is a good question. Um, the metals that we use are are um, are, are pretty inert. Uh, meaning they're not ones that we think have um, much reaction for most patients. Um, and the reactions that most people have to certain metals or foreign materials, it tends to be um, on the skin itself or on mucous membranes, things you know, like the oral or nasal cavity or on the skin itself. Um, those types of cells that we think are responsible for those kinds of reduction activities uh, we don't find them uh, much within the, you know, the knee joint itself, so we don't worry about that very much. Um, it's kind of an area of controversy within our field uh, to what degree um, that occurs, if, 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 if at all. Um, so we don't routinely put uh, patients on any medications, that, you know, in terms of preventing the rejection of those. Thank you. 
can someone have two knee replacements at the same time? They can. Um, I typically, um, so it, it's not terribly uncommon for us to see patients who have both their knees that are bothering them quite significantly. And um, that would, at least in theory, uh, be intended for both knee replacements. Um, I certainly have done those. Um, I typically try to um, advise patients against doing that simply because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big pill to swallow, so to speak. Uh, you don't have a good leg to stand on, if you'll forgive the pun. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something that it makes the recovery even that much more difficult. Um, there are some surgeons who have gotten to the point where they, um, they flat out refuse to actually do that because there's some emerging data that say um, that it may actually not even be very safe in, in, in some patients and exposes them to unnecessary risk. So um, I really usually will try to um, advise the patient against doing that. It's been very infrequent that I've done both at the same time. I've been um, just overwhelmingly happy that we did it, uh, sort of seeing the patient, you know, going through both at the same time. It's just, it's just quite a lot to go through. Thank you. Is there a risk that someone comes in for a partial knee replacement and then during the surgery, it's discovered that they need to have a full knee replacement? If that happens, what are the next steps? That's a great question. Um, because there's only so many ways that we can try to figure out what part of the knee or parts of the knee are involved uh, before surgery. So usually we have a pretty good idea uh, which part or parts of the knee are going to be involved, but we don't know, you know sort of infallibly. Um, so I will always tell patients that if we get in the, you know, if we get inside of the knee, we find that actually it's not quite what we thought uh, and things are worse or more than one part of the knee is involved or there's some other reason that we think that a total knee would be a better option. It's not as though we're going to proceed with a partial knee replacement. I'll always have that conversation with the patient beforehand and say, if we get in there, um, we're doing a total knee replacement, the fast switching is, is, is kind of the best thing to do. In my hands, that happens around 3% of the time. So it's not very frequent, but it certainly is not zero either. So I always try to make sure to speak with the patient about that beforehand so that um, we can make sort of a game time decision to do the best thing for the patient as, a, as opposed to just uh, sort of the original thing that we had thought about. So anytime we do a partial knee replacement, we also have total knee replacement instruments and parts that are ready to go in case we need to do that. Thank you. Two related questions. How long should someone expect a total knee replacement to last? And what are the signs that a total knee replacement is failing? This is a great, this is a great question for a lot of flexibility. Um, so the short answer is for any individual, meaning how long is, um, that Joe Smith's knee replacement going to last, the is we don't know. Um, all we can really do is look at large groups of data um, that we have um, long-term outcomes on. And so about 20 uh, or so years ago, there was an advance in terms of the technology of the materials that we were using, and they, and they got a lot better. Um, and so now we think that knee replacements are lasting longer than what they used to. Uh, just by an improvement in terms of, um, of the material that we're using. So now, um, you know, we don't, we, so we don't really have like 30 year follow up on those patients because, because those materials just haven't been out for that long, um, in large enough numbers. Um, but it seems to be the case now that long term studies would suggest that about, um, you know, at around 15 years out from the surgery, about 85% of those knee replacements are still in and have never had to be reoperated on. Um, and how long do we think that we're, do we think they're going to last? Um, it wouldn't be uncommon for something to last 15 to 25 years even. I'm always hesitant to answer that question for any individual because you can't take large groups of data and apply it to an individual. Uh, I, I think that's unfair. So really what we have to do is we, is we just have to look at, well, what are the chances and what does large scale data tell us on that? Um, so it's a little bit of a nuanced answer, I think, but I think that's the most honest answer that we can get. And as to the second part of the question, what are some signs that the knee replacement may no longer be working? Typically, um, they will manifest in things like pain is the number one thing, pain that doesn't go away, pain that continues or worsens, in particular worsens with, with uh, certain types of activity. And it can be um, accompanied by things like swelling as well, um, or an inability to do certain things with that knee, um, meaning loss of range of motion, or feeling of weakness. But really pain and swelling are probably the two biggest. Thank you. 
if someone has already had an ACL replacement, does that mean that they are not able to have a partial knee replacement and can only have a total knee replacement? Um, I would say not necessarily, um, but it would it would um, it would raise my eyebrows a little bit uh, to consider doing a partial knee replacement on a patient who's previously had an ACL reconstruction. Again, the reason for that is usually those two things go hand in hand, where ACL deficiency, meaning the ACL is not working as well anymore, usually is accompanied by problems in more than just one part of the knee. So I wouldn't say it's impossible, but I would say it's it's not very common um, that that would be the case. Um, and it certainly would raise my eyebrows a little bit if I knew someone who had an ACL reconstruction and we were going to do a partial replacement. I wouldn't say it's impossible, um, certainly, um, but you know, it would um, raise the chances that a total name would be appropriate. Thank you. Can you have a partial knee replacement if you have patellofemoral arthritis? Yeah, so you, you can, that's a, that's a special type of partial knee replacement called uh, a patellofemoral joint replacement. The x-rays that I showed of, of the partial knee replacement, they were all, uh, I think they were all medial, meaning the inner part of the knee, knee replacements. Uh, but there can be a patellofemoral orthoplasty only. Um, and that is used um, when, a, when a patient really only has arthritis just in that one part of the knee. Um, so we would think that if their inner and outer part of the knee um, look okay or they have severe arthritis underneath the kneecap, uh, that someone may be a candidate for that. Thank you. Do knee replacement procedures get more complicated if a patient waits too long to get the procedure done? They certainly can. Um, I, I think that in general, um, what I uh, try to express to patients is that arthritis, which is the number one reason why people have knee replacements, um, is kind of a one-way road, uh, meaning it really only gets worse, um, but how quickly it does that is widely variable. And people can have um, severe knee arthritis that doesn't drastically worsen for years and years. Um, and so I would say if patients put off knee replacement for years and years, it can become more complicated um, but that's, that's, that's not always the case. And how long it takes for the knee replacement to get more complicated um, is widely variable. Now you might think, well, what are the things that could make it more complicated? Um, those would be things like um, arthritis that continues where the two bones continue to rub against each other, which leads to more severe deformities, or um, you could essentially think of that as worsening the angle that the knee makes, or range of motion that the knee is able to accomplish or sometimes the size of the bone spurs that develop, or the amount of bone loss that a patient will experience when the two bones are rubbing against each other. Uh, because over time, um, that will cause bone loss. Um, and those are the sorts of things that can make things a little bit more complicated from a surgical standpoint, making it more difficult or more involved or a little bit more lengthy recovery or things of that nature. Thank you. How do you choose the specific types of parts that are used in a replacement? Does the type of activities that a patient does, do those matter? Um, the type of, um, the, so the type of prosthetic that somebody uh, will receive, um, usually is not widely different from patient to patient, if I'm understanding the, the question correctly. Um, and so surgeons typically will choose a type of implant uh, that matches their, their familiarity um, meaning they've used it a lot and they're happy with the instrumentation of that particular implant. Um, and uh, in terms of which particular implant somebody receives, uh, there's a bunch of different sizes for any given uh, particular implant. And so the decision about what size um, or the width of particular implants, those are decisions that are made during surgery for the majority of knee replacement surgeries. Um, there is such a thing as a patient specific implant where those things are kind of decided beforehand. Um, based on advanced imaging, whether it's you know like a CT scan or something like that, um, so that there's not really any decisions that are made about um, which particular implant is used. Those aren't real common though. Um, they constitute only a small percentage of knee replacement um, of knee replacements that, that are done. So I hope I've understood the question there correctly. It's, it's possible that I misunderstood it though. Thank you. Before someone has uh, knee surgery 
What pain medicine do you suggest that they use to deal with their arthritis pain? So the most common uh, medicine that we will use for arthritis pain is an anti-inflammatory type of, type of a medicine. And this comes in a wide variety of um, flavors, if you will. Um, there's over-the-counter um, versions of that. And those are things like ibuprofen or Advil or Motrin or Aleve or Naproxen, uh, things like that. Um, and those tend to be pretty effective at decreasing pain, at least in the short term for those patients. And there's also prescription varieties that are a little bit stronger or that have other features, such as being a little gentle on the stomach or things like that. Um, those can be combined with medicines like Tylenol, which can act in a different way. Um, in rare cases, over the short term, we can use even stronger medicines. But those are not really advised in the long term to manage arthritis pain in most cases. Um, so the most common ones that we use are the anti-inflammatories. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Holst. That is all the questions that we have time for today. If we were unable to answer your question live, we will answer it later in the comments. Dr. Holst, would you like to close? I just want to thank everyone for their time. Uh, those are a lot of really good questions, and uh, those were questions that, um, that are true to life, meaning that we see those oftentimes in clinics and that have hopefully some, some applicability to, uh, to a lot of different patients with knee problems. Um, I want to thank everyone you know, just for taking a little bit of time for the, for the presentation, um, and certainly I'd be happy to answer any other questions that Margaret uh, takes in from you all and to try to answer those.